full appointment? No, we, we definitely stop me at 1230. Um, okay. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. All right, uh, Lisa is in the audience and uh, Melissa Eckbell are in the audience. Kathy is not. Let me text Kathy and see if she's going to join us. Okay. okay. All right. I'm going to call this meeting of governance organization and legislation to order. According to my watch, it is 932. Or sorry, <laughs> somewhere it's 932, but here it's 1032. Um, uh, this meeting is being recorded. And pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, this meeting of GOL is being conducted via remote participation. I'm first going to just make sure that um, everyone can be heard and be seen. We're also going to bring at least one sponsor into the meeting. I think Lisa Clausen is in the audience and um, I have said that she could, she could be a panelist. So first, let me make sure that, that we all can be seen and heard. I'm gonna start with Pat. Oh, Pat, Pat okay. is there, great. Andy? Yep, I'm here. Thank you. Um, Mandy? I'm here. Okay, and uh, Lynn? Here. Thank you. And our guest panelist, Lisa? Can you just, uh... hi Lisa, you can hear us? Yes, I can. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so we have a full agenda, no surprise. Um, we have uh, two bylaws and a resolution on the agenda today. So we're going to try and move as quickly, but as carefully as we can. Um, we're going to continue first with the wage theft uh, bylaws. I believe we have the uh, wage and tip theft bylaw up uh, for review. Um, then uh, we are going to move to the wild, what I'm calling briefly the wild animal uh, bylaw. And then we have a resolution, which my understanding, Lynn, is this is not of uh, pressing concern, so we could delay it if we have to. Is that mm -hmm. true? The resolution on East West Rail? Well, we delayed it from last week. So okay, I all right. So we should try. Okay, good. So that's not item number three. We do not have any minutes. Um, so uh, that's, those are the three items on our agenda. Um, so I'm going to, uh, again, as I did last time, turn to Mandy, if she's willing to sort of take us through um, the, the second bylaw. And uh, in your packet, you should have uh, this document and you should open it or use the screen. Uh, screen is quite clear, so we could work with the screen. And as we did last time, I think we're going to go through it change by change, line by line. My understanding, Mandy, is that this has, in a sense, been, quote unquote, cleaned up. In other words, what this document shows are only places, and please correct me, Mandy, if I'm wrong, but only places where there are still remaining disagreements between uh, the sponsors and KP Law. Is that correct? Um, basically, it's correct. And I, I would say disagreements is a broad term. Um, okay. it, the first one we'll go to is not necessarily a disagreement. I think KP law would be okay with the change, but because they suggested something else and we were suggesting we wanted to keep the original, we left it in as, quote, a disagreement, even if KP law would be okay with keeping the original. Um, so, but, but pretty much if KP law suggested a change and the sponsors said, yeah, that's fine. We accepted those changes and you don't see them here anymore to ease the reading of things. Um, yes. so you'll see that there were a lot of changes KP law suggested that you don't see anymore because they've just been accepted in. And the first one is this criminal enforcement. Um, the sponsors really wanted only retaliation to be criminally enforced and KP law when they went through everything suggested that it be any violation of this bylaw um, and and the sponsors still intend to keep it as retaliation. Um, I, I don't know Pat, I, I think in talking to Kathy, um, she had indicated that she might be willing to remove criminal enforcement completely. I don't know where Pat stands on that because, and part of that is because retaliation is kept is dealt with a lot with a lot severe consequences in state law. 
Um, but, but we did not as sponsors believe that the failure to post, um, post sort of the rules should be enforced criminally, which is why we had limited it only to the retaliation. And so, so in that sense, we disagreed with the expansion of criminal enforcement to any violation, including just the failure to post notices. Um, and so that's why we left it here as a quote disagreement, even though KP law would be fine with keeping it as just retaliation. Okay. Um, since I would, yeah, any thoughts from my colleagues? I can't raise my hand because I'm... Uh, go ahead, Lynn. I, I agree with the sponsors. I don't see why this should be for all violations. Lynn, I couldn't hear your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> She agrees I, with the sponsors. I agree with the sponsors. I don't believe this should be for all violations. Since the sponsors wish to uh, reject this suggestion, and it's not, as far as I can see, um, has anything to do with actionability, clarity, or consistency, um, though there might be a policy question related to the larger issue of, you know, where the bylaw, you know, as you said, Mandy, um, actually the state has much more severe penalties. And so there could be um, a question about, broader question of whether um, we should be entering into those areas at all. And so one might suggest that, that there not be any penalties um, because the state has it covered. Um, Again, I'm facing this constant question, is that, is that a policy question? Or it, it's not really a measure, you know, it's enforceability in a sense, um, but is that actionability? So my thought is we just le let the sponsor keep what they had and uh, make a note of this in the report if any counselor wants to raise the question of the larger issue of tension or Conf or you know between and I can't hear George and I'm not sure I'm hearing anyone else and anyone hear me it's George I'm having problems with hearing too Really? No, oh, great. Um, Bruce, can I just clarify? Are you are you talking about eliminating all, uh, even non -criminal, criminal dispositions, or are you just talking about criminal enforcement? In your opinion, uh, I'm trying to thread the thin line. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Thank you. Okay, I, I'll try to be trying to thin the tread the line between just making sure this is clear, consistent, and actionable, mm -hmm. as opposed to larger policy questions or larger questions of that, you know, this bylaw faces in a number of different places where it goes beyond or enters into areas where the state already has, in this case, um, penalties. They have penalties for retaliation and right. I, I would be, uh, comfortable with removing criminal enforcement. However, non-criminal disposition for violations of uh, wage and tip. No, no, yeah, I agree. No, I'm sorry, I missed, okay. I wasn't thinking, yes. No, yeah, I have no problem with that. that. clarification. Yeah, it's criminal enforcement. Um, and my thought was just leave it as the sponsors wanted and not accept the KP law proposed change. But I can hear that there's a bit of disagreement amongst this, or at least uh, difference among the sponsors themselves. So, um, well, Kathy's willing to remove it. I'm willing to yeah. remove it. I, I think, I think if, I think everyone, given what we've learned about state enforcement of retaliation and the severity of those penalties, that if Pat's willing to, and Kathy is willing to, and I'm willing to, we could remove the criminal enforcement completely. Yeah. Okay. Well, that is, that's certainly, 
I leave it up to you guys. Um, we can leave it in or we can take it out, but. Um, taking it out, George, I think it's clear. All right, so the, uh, good. So Mandy has stricken it. We moving on? Please, thank you. I got fine. There weren't many in this one, so. No, exactly. And this, Trust me, I've never been more pleased to see such a clean text in my life. So, and, and some of these um, weren't necessarily disagreements, but I-, I Differences know, would have been a better word. And, and differences isn't even the right one. For some okay. of these, it was more of, I, I didn't feel right removing comments, um, even though there was no suggestions. So that's why some of them are still here. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so, so like this one here, that whole number three, we, we left the comments in even though, um, this was not something that KP Law actually recommended doing anything with. It was more of a do you know comment. Right. Um, right. Yeah. And so I, I felt weird taking the comment out, but there was nothing she rec the KP Law recommended changing about this. Right. Um, so I don't know whether we need to discuss it or not. I think we don't actually. Um, I think the, the challenge is how to get <clears throat> or whether we, whether the it needs to be in a, a report from GOL where the the attorney has made a comment but not actually made a um, a, a suggested change, and I I don't know how quite to handle that. I think that's a, a question for the report from GOL, which I means question for question for the chair. If we're talking about the sanctuary city one, yep, I think that should be um, the KP laws comment should be removed. We are a sanctuary city. And we have faced um, the fact that we could uh, affect, not apply for grants and other federal aid. We were threatened with that when we made the bylaw, when it was voted uh, nearly 100% of town meeting uh, voting positively. So I don't think we need this comment at all. I think that the lawyer is bringing up a fear that is not um, connected to the town's values. Um, we're not unaware of it. Um, it's just a waste. It's, a, it's another thing to scare people with. So and I understand yeah. that she feels it's being conservative, but mm -hmm. I also feel like it is loading fear on to making a decision. And some people fall for that. Okay. Anyone I else? I, I disagree with that, but. Well, I think so. it's a question. Yeah. Do you want this in the GOL report is the question. It doesn't go anywhere else. I, I, I understand where Pat's coming from. I, but I actually agree with Andy in that, it, well, I know town meeting was very aware of this. Many of us are very aware of this, even, even though we may not have been in town meeting. But I think the purpose of this review was to make sure that we highlighted the places where other legal issues should just be known. That's all. I don't think it's going to scare anybody on the council. But as a matter of due diligence, where we have um, comments from the attorney who is reviewing something, um, it seems probably appropriate that at least be, in, in cases like this, it be acknowledged. <clears throat> I'm certainly not going to comment on it. I'm just going to note it. Yeah, and I think for the purposes of this committee, we should note that while it's a comment that was offered, we don't think that it affects whether it's clear, consistent, and actionable. Thank you. That's, that's a good summary, Andy. Yes. Maybe part of the report is comments offered by attorneys that don't affect actionability, clarity, and consistency or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, clearly label it. Right, right. As a comment and is not something that the committee is passing any kind of judgment on. Good. So, so the next one, we actually deleted something that was between three and four. Um, and so the comments are no longer there. I think this comment from KP Law, again, in my opinion, this should be deleted, refers to the paragraph we actually did delete. Um, so 
but but what we did instead of deleting it is um, change the wording. And the reason it's in here as still sort of a difference is because um, none of us could remember if this was specifically talked about with KP law and agreed upon that it was a fine change. But, but basically the concern with KP law was that we were setting a different standard for retaliation in terms of how you prove it and stuff like that. And so our change basically says if the attorney general has found retaliation under state or federal law, um, then our burden of proof for retaliation is met. Um, and so we pegged it to, you know, the, the attorney general's sort of findings um, so that the town just, it, it's just sort of a, accepting the attorney general's findings. And so we believe that that's a decent um, compromise from removing it completely. Um, and the, K, you know, the KP law's concern of removing it completely or just request to remove completely. Um, but recognizing the concern that the enforcement authority for retaliation is the AG. Um, and so that's sort of what our attempt at rewording does to now read a finding by the attorney general of retaliation under state or federal law shall be sufficient to show retaliation under this bylaw period. Um, Mandy Jo, I'm just curious, or Pat, the one that you deleted, basically what you're saying is this is now subsumed into the, the one that starts standard of proof. The one we deleted, let me look that one up on a different. Um, it shall be considered a rebuttable or presumption of retaliation. If an employer or any other person takes an adverse action against the person in the days of a person's exercise of rights protected in this bylaw, or any other state law regulating the payment of compensation. However, in the case of C yeah. So we deleted that one at the request, uh, essentially um, determining that um, we didn't need that in this bylaw. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. And I then like we tried to reword this one. Mandy, if this were taken out completely, what would be the adverse impact from your perspective as sponsors if Forge simply were deleted? So then to, in order to find under this bylaw for retaliation, the individuals writing those non-criminal disposition right. tickets right. would have to actually prove retaliation. Um, right. Whereas the non-criminal disposition, you know, sort of fine for retaliation for violation of the bylaw right. under retaliation now can just be written if they can prove the AG has. Exactly. Provides, I see. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Anyone have any further comments? I have no problem with this uh, um, the way it stands. I'm fine. No problem either. Okay. All right, Mandy. So I'll leave it that. I'll accept them later. Um, then again, the C prior comments from KP law are the other ones about things. Um, we want to leave it in. Um, I think I, uh, Pat, I, I think you talked to KP law more about this. We believe that if someone thinks that, you know, that, that if you believe in good faith, the bylaw has been violated and you report that to the town and the town finds that you were wrong, that the bylaw actually wasn't violated, that you should still be protected on a retaliation claim. Yes. Um, and so that's why we would like to keep it in. Um, you know, and, and I think KP law again, was concerned about retaliation being covered a lot by the AG's office, but but we do believe it's important for someone who reports a potential violation of this bylaw. There's no posting or this or that, or they didn't get their right notice, um, and maybe they were wrong because maybe you know they they don't speak English well, and so they misunderstood things, but really made that report in good faith, and um, that that they're still protected from being fired because of that report. So we want to keep it in. 
I think you, I, I agree with you, but I think that you should then have this be one of those things that we dis discussed above. You know, one of those that isn't related to actionable. Oh. That sure. George mentions in his yeah. report. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And again, the the uh, comment of KP law is that this is covered by state law, and so they don't think it's necessary. Is that a fair? What is the what is the difference here? Again? Her her prior comments are going back to sanctuary city stuff and right. the right. enforcement authority for violations and all of that. Um, you right. know, beyond that, I. I'm not sure Pat and I can really describe what she was thinking. Okay. All right. so it's, it's not okay. Okay. Well, I'm really bad in my reports when I'm trying to uh, clarify something that's not clear. <laughs> <laughs> and we are bad doing it the same in person. I know, I, you certainly not that required. So this may be something, Lynn, that I'm just going to let, let a sleeping dog lie. Um, Cause I don't even know what I would say here. Um, but um, we're, we're just going to leave it in. Yes, and without comment from GOL. Um, did, you they, speaking to, not to five. Yes, just to five, not yeah. not to uh, the previous. Yeah, just to this one. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. Just let it go. Don't don't mention anything. <laughs> well, I, I just I don't know what to mention. So yeah. But, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, I don't know if everyone was present. Um, or I think it came up in prior discussion, but um, we have a request out to KP Law for clarification from the last meeting on two uh, items. And I also have sent out um, Alyssa's, or I tried to uh, express Alyssa's concern. So we have right now three things that we're asking for. What, what was Alyssa's concern? Because I must have missed that somewhere. Well, it was, I reached out to her directly to get some clarification um, from her as to exactly what um, she was, I think, basically there's a history that exists here um, that uh, in terms of an existing bylaw that the, the town has 3.44 and at least two existing TIF, this is around, around the TIF all right, but we're talking about tip theft right now, wage theft and tip theft, not TIF. So I'm- No, I understand. This, I'm, this is a sideline. I apologize, Pat. This is a sideline. Mandy was asking about what Alyssa's question was on Monday at the council meeting. And I felt that I was basically being asked to communicate that question to um, KP Law for clarification. And you're right. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about right here. And so um, okay, but I'll go back point, to my notes from the council meeting then. Yeah, and you can, we can, uh, but anyway, I did try to put it in what I thought was uh, of question form, and I, that was also sent to KP Law. So now three things that specific questions, um, and I'd like to keep it to a minimum if we can. But did you give her a deadline? Yeah, I didn't understand that, Pat. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm eating crackers. <laughs> Is, has she been given a deadline for when we want the responses? No, she hasn't, but um, I will be reaching out to Paul again and asking him to just follow up again. Um, maybe Paul will tell me I can reach out to her directly. I don't see why I can't just email her directly as GOL chair and yeah. ask her, but I need just to get Paul's permission. Yeah. Um, so if we're ready to move on, the only yes, other thing we highlighted was the requirements for succession and interest. The language here is the same language we discussed last week under the um, responsible employer bylaw. And so we highlighted that if KP law comes back with a better definition um, and all, that we should probably make the two um, clauses in each bylaw identical. So we obviously don't have any and, and the interesting thing is while KP law highlighted the successor and interest clause in the responsible employer, they did not note a successor and that note anything problematic with this successor and interest clause. So I do want to make that clear that in reviewing this one, there was actually nothing mentioned about this successor and interest clause, even though it's identical to the one that KP law did highlight in the other one and delete. Um, 
and all. So I, I think we desire as sponsors to have them identical, but we're fine with this language and it was not highlighted by KP law. This uh, is one of the things that we did ask them to um, yeah. comment on, to get back to us. Um, there was one item that uh, they had not seen and we just wanted them to look at and make sure they were okay with. And this was, I believe the second item, which was, do you have any language to request to us for successor uh, in interest? And that's what I'm waiting to hear from them on. And now I've so, added this is to that list. Yeah, so we just highlighted in a comment that if we change it in the one, we likely would exactly right. try to change it in this one too. So could we just go back to 4C because in the copy we had last week, um, this one, the sponsors, I guess, for 4C, 1 through 4, just said we will need to be ready to defend how this calculation was different. That was a KP law comment. Oh, it was. Okay. Yes. Okay. But there was no indication from KP law that it needed changed in any way. So we deleted the comment. Okay. And again, that could be something <clears throat> that could go in the GOL report. Um, so again, with the note that it does not it'll in any way affect clarity, consistency, consistency yeah. or actionability. Yeah. I'm not even sure it needs to go in your KP law. Yeah, again, these are the kinds of yeah, decisions that I don't envy myself. <laughs> so we have gone through this entire document, I believe, um, yep. noting the places where there have been changes or differences. And we have a, um, completed that review. So I think we are finished with this document. I think we, GOL as a body needs to vote clarity, consistency, and actionability a motion and vote on whether it is or not for both yep. bylaws. Absolutely, yes. That would be the yeah. next step. Um, I, have a, I just want to let you know that I reviewed both bylaws again this morning before the meeting. And I actually did have one question about the responsible employer bylaw, but generally I am at a point where, except for my one question that I you might have a quick answer to, I'm perfectly fine with um, the conclusion that, uh, that this committee needs to make about clarity, consistency, and actionability. I'd like to hear Andy, Andy's question, but I'm in the same place. I'm ready to move. Okay. Yeah, I would like to hear Andy's question as well. Now, my thought is that we would do them separately. We would not, they would each be done as a separate vote. And um, so we could go back and do the responsible employer bylaw first. Um, which is, and then we could deal with Andy's question at that point. Um, but I do need to come back, if, if only for my own uh, peace of mind, to the question raised and discussed at the council meeting as well, as to um, the question of counselors, uh, members of the committee who are sponsors voting on clarity, consistency, and actionability. And uh, we've had this discussion last time and um, we didn't make any kind of formal decision. And I'm not saying that we should make a formal decision, but I'm still a bit just personally unclear. Um, I hear very clearly the arguments that um, counselors should not be kept from voting on measures that come before them when they're serving on a committee or obviously serving on a council. And the fact of sponsorship um, is immaterial. Andy felt, and I still am struggling a bit, with the thought that somehow GOL is different. Um, and the answer may be it's not different, um, but I still don't have clarity in my mind completely. Um, it seems to me there is something about GOL's uh, task that um, does raise a kind of, of problem when you're talking about simply the issue of clarity, consistency, and actionability. Um, sponsors supporting a measure for passage seems perfectly natural. Sponsors who are passing judgment on the issue of clarity, consistency, and actionability seems like that they're really not neutral in any sense at all in that case. Um, and there seems to be an element, as I've said, of neutrality that, that functions in this committee, meaning that I could very well have a resolution or a bylaw in front of me that I think is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life and would never vote for it ever under any circumstances 
but still declare it clear, consistent, and actionable, and assist the sponsor in, in making it such. Um, as opposed to me saying, you know, I have no problem with clear, consistent, actionable, but this is, the, this is a horrible uh, bylaw or this is a horrible resolution or whatever. Um, so it does seem that our committee is a little different than other committees where we're performing a kind of uh, service to the council um, that being a sponsor would seem to be an issue for that service. So that's where I'm struggling. Um, I absolutely agree that, that, you know, and any other committee where you're dealing with, you know, content and you are the sponsor of a, of a, of a measure or bylaw, whatever, um, you should certainly be free to speak for it and to vote on it. Um, but is, I guess the question is, isn't there something different about what GOL does that raises a, a, just a practical question about whether if you're a sponsor for a measure, you can um, be objective about clarity, consistency, and actionability. Um, even though you participate in that discussion at great length and are, as a sponsor, help us get to that goal, um, that's my question. And, I, I, yeah, Pat? I hear your concern, George, and I respect it. Um, however, I think that um, I've been on GOL since it was formed, what, two years ago? Um, and this issue has never come up and people have sponsored resolutions, proclamations, bylaws. But the reason I can't support it is because you have the two sponsors, two of the three sponsors here, and we have shown over and over again that we will, that we listen, that we go back and take into consideration the comments of our colleagues, the comments of the lawyers. We don't always come to agreement. The only thing that we're voting on is whether it's clear, consistent, and actionable. And in truth, uh, four months ago when I wanted it to be voted on, I couldn't have, as a GOL member, voted on it with some of the issues that were there. So I think that there is an element of faith that you need to have in your colleagues. Um, and I don't think that's a misguided assumption. Um, I don't know. So I'm going to, I came at it from the view of somebody who's new to the committee, which is the opposite of what you just said. And, you know, Mandy's done a lot of really good work and you've done a lot of good work, but Mandy's statements at a couple of times, even today were that the sponsors have talked about this and the sponsors agree that this is an acceptable um, change. And it struck me every time she's done that, that I've got these two things going on. On the one hand, I really appreciate what she just said, and that it really has helped the committee move forward, just as um, we've had with other sponsors like Darcy in the plastic bag bylaw. But on the other hand, it sort of seemed to be a role that was different from the role of the committee. And that's where I was feeling uncomfortable. Mandy Jo has her hand up. Please, Mandy. So a couple of things. Um, with that, I'll address Andy first and then I'll say some other things. Um, with what Andy just said, the sponsors operated under the assumption that GOL asks for a town attorney opinion and revisions because GOL intends to accept what the town attorney says with that. Um, and therefore, if the sponsors agreed with those changes, there was no issue in terms of um, whether that change is problematic or not for GOL. Um, I think that's an assumption that maybe we need to talk about in GOL. In GOL in the past, we've gone with these opinions and said, okay, are we accepting the council, the town councils, the town attorney's changes? Um, are the town attorney making it clear, consistent, and actionable? And I guess that's something in this review, we didn't actually review all of those changes um, for whether the town attorney was being clear, consistent, and actionable. Um, but I think in this case, the sponsors assumed that any change the town attorney was making, GOL would accept as a change for clarity, consistency, or actionability. And therefore, if the sponsors agreed with it, that the only problem was if the sponsors didn't agree with it. 
Um, so maybe we need to discuss what GOL does with suggested changes from a town attorney for future bylaws. So, so that's my response to that um, in terms of wh whether I was operating. So I was operating as a sponsor in that sense, but I still maintain that GOL has no difference than CRC or TSO. Imagine if these three sponsors of this bylaw were all on TSO. We happened to not any of us be on TSO, but it is, was entirely possible we could have all been on TSO, just like two of us happened to be on GOL. Um, so does that mean that going into TSO and reviewing something that has three sponsors that already, as, as anyone would suggest, suggest, already support all of that, what's the point of a TSO review if a majority of the council of the majority of the body is already a supporter of it? Um, so you have to take, as Pat said, with faith that this is no different than that type of review because what's the point of sending it to a committee that has the sponsors on it when you already know what their vote's going to be? Um, so I, I don't believe a GOL review is any different in terms of voting than a review at a different committee where the sponsors happen to be on that committee for a substantive review. And I still maintain that we as counselors are elected by the body, um, by the town to vote um, and vote however we decide we vote. And this is not an instance where there is any required recusal. And I don't believe, and I strongly, I strongly believe that no other counselor can tell me whether I must recuse myself from a vote for something that state law does not require me to recuse from or that the charter does not require me to recuse from. That is my own decision and the council, the other fellow counselors can look at the GOL vote or look at the CRC vote or look at the TSO vote when there's sponsors on that and make a decision as to how how to interpret my own vote if I'm also a sponsor. You'll see um, the Wild Animal Act bylaw, the sponsor was on the committee that substantively reviewed it. I'd have to go back to see whether that sponsor abstained or not from a recommend to the council to pass or not. Um, I'm not sure she did. I think it was a unanimous vote, 5-0 um, in committee, and that sponsor was on the committee. So we had no right to tell that sponsor that she couldn't vote because she was a sponsor there and I don't believe any counselor has a right to tell me whether I can or can't vote on this committee either. Lynn? I'm going to uh, take Mandy Joe's comments um, back to front. First of all, uh, there is no state law that says anything about recusal in this situation. In addition to that, when the council briefly discussed this on, on Monday, we came to no conclusion. Yeah. So there is no council direction on this. And if there were, it would have to be in our rules of procedure. And even then, I think that could be contested by the fact that it's not in state law. So, I mean, you've all heard how I feel about this. I feel that every counselor has a vote no matter the issue, unless state law requires that they recuse. Um, second of all, I'm, and when we get to this, I'm more than glad to discuss it. I never take attorney's opinions as the word. I look at them and say, do I agree? And I'll go back and I'll argue with them and I'll, you know, say, no, I don't want to agree with that. And I've had moments where I've had to work with directly with our attorneys for the town on the issue of the evaluation and records for the town um, manager. And, um, you know, it, it wasn't until I went back and around about five times asking my questions different ways that I ever got complete clarity and an acceptable way in which to handle it. So it, when I look at an attorney's opinion, I do not accept it as the word. Building on that a little bit, uh, somehow or other, we overvalue KP Law's comments uh, we've had two other lawyers looking at these things and disagreeing and sharply disagreeing with her evaluations and her conclusions on a variety of issues. So does that make her, why does that make her voice uh, predominant instead of, hey, we've had two other lawyers look at this and they don't agree. So um, 
I don't want to lose my ability to think through anyone's comments, whether they're my own um, or a lawyer's or Andy's or anybody's. And I don't want to be restricted in my responsibilities as a counselor. I want, I want to be clear. My comments were not disrespect for the law. My father no, was a lawyer. I'm not either. My comments were not disrespect for KP law. It's just how I... I've dealt with legal opinions for most of my 51, 48 years or whatever of professional life. And that's how I've always dealt. I, the reason it's worth listening to is because if it were contested and we were ending up in court, they're going to be our attorneys. And so we, we need to evaluate it. And I think we do need to give it extra weight. Uh, when it comes to a policy question, such as we just were talking about with uh, uh, the, the, the question of uh, what, what would happen if, uh, if there was an action by the federal government against us because uh, of the reasons stated. You know, we evaluated that. That was a risk question, not a lot. Uh, and it was what it was. Right. I, I was just going to say, uh, we need to evaluate, but our lawyer would have to find a way to defend our decision if we were taken to court. And I'm assuming that they would do a really good job. I don't think there's anything in this document where we've said that we don't accept legal the legal opinion where it was a matter of risk mostly the places where we said, no, we want to keep it in. It was a matter of duplication of state law. And so I'm ready to vote, gang. Okay, I, I think I can hear that. Um, I still feel that my point has been kind of missed and, and I'm not gonna, I don't want to beat it to death, but um, you all, what all of you are saying, I agree with. I don't, I don't have any problem with, but nobody has, seems to have the sense that I have, and that then I'm going to leave it here, I guess, is that, that what GOL, GOL does is different than what other committees do. Um, and that, that's where it is different, George, but it doesn't mean counselors have to recuse themselves. Yeah. The real, and in the end, it is not a committee that makes the decision, it is the council. And as Mandy Jo said, you can look at the minutes, you can see who voted which way. And if you feel like somehow or another there was skillduggery, then you know you can take that into account. But the committee is just a recommendation. So I'm ready to uh, entertain a motion to declare um, the responsible employer bylaw to be clear, consistent, and act to recommend to the council that it, we declare it clear, consistent, and actionable. I second. Now, Andy, I believe you had a question. Uh, or did you, about this particular bylaw? The, uh, the motion is on the uh, wage theft. Um, no, this motion is on the responsible employer bylaw. Right. Then and, uh, it's a fairly, here, here's what the question is. Um, and um, I don't know if you want to, um, if you have it up, have it available, Mandy, and put it up. What I'm looking at is on the bottom of page two, G and H. And G, um, I think, are the two um, ones that are there because on the one hand it says shall give a preference to Amherst residents and thereafter residents of Hampshire, Hampton and Franklin County. <clears throat> and um, in the next one, their endeavor it endeavors to uh, achieve percentages in certain uh, listed categories. <clears throat> and how does a contractor deal with the question of 
um, what to do if those two seem in conflict with each other because one preference makes it impossible to achieve the other preference. So um, I'll, I'll try to respond to that. Section H in both this one and the the TIF, because it, it's repeated in both, um, is a you're trying to, and there are no penalties if you do not do it. Um, whereas section G is a you shall. So that sort of gives you the idea of which one gets preferenced depending on it. And so part of the documentation that the contractor would have to provide under section H or I, I think it is, because it goes on to submit the, right. wherever it's submit um, compliant, it's still an H. Um, sure. Would what, what the contractor could do is say, hey, in giving, in complying with section G, I was not able to comply with section H because everyone that fit the say veteran one didn't live in Hampshire, Hamden or Franklin counties. And so I, I had to make the choice and because G is a shall and H is a shall endeavor, um, shall one out. And it would just be simply a providing the documentation to that or making that statement. Andy, is that, does that satisfy you or do you have a further question? Um, we're, I'm getting into clarity and I guess yeah, sure. the question is whether there is um, other language that could be used that would make the preference uh, are, are the importance of the section strong, more, more clear for the reader, future readers of the bylaw as to which one is the, is the uh, predominant one? Because mm -hmm. uh, uh, if I'm a contractor looking at it uh, and I'm not, not a lawyer and I get into the questions of the distinction between shall not discriminate and shall endeavor to, I'm not sure it's as clear to somebody who hasn't, doesn't approach it from that kind of a legal pers mm -hmm. um, perspective. And uh, so it's not that I'm disagreeing with the policy, I'm just, it's a clarity question. Shall endeavor was KP Law's idea. Um, and you shall not discriminate, um, seems to me that we're making sure that if, um, residents of Connecticut who are already working for a contractor or applying for positions aren't discriminated against, um, I don't see the, I, I guess I just don't see the problem in the same, I just don't quite see it, Andy. Can you say it in a different way for me? Um, I'm a contractor, not a lawyer, and I'm looking at the two and I'm trying to weigh between trying to give preference to uh, residents of Massachusetts to equally qualified and yeah. Yeah. with references to Amherst residents and uh, trying to achieve the goals of 15.3% uh, of people of color. And uh, I'm not sure that it's as, uh, I, I want it to be clear to the contractor as to which one they should take right. first. Right. Right, right. Just raising the question as to whether it is sufficiently clear to a non-lawyer reader of the bylaw. Lisa, do you have anything you want to say to this? Um, I, you know, I, I wavered back and forth, raised my hand and didn't because I, um, I don't have an answer on the clarity issue in the language. I guess I would say from a practical perspective, um, 
you know, the contractor is in, is usually in pretty regular contact with the city staff who work on these issues and would just ask the question. And I think, um, but, and, and also, you know, on projects that we've had that have had both a residency goal as well as diversity goals, they're, they're really, the shall endeavor really speaks to it. They're, they're trying to meet it if, you know, they might do better on one of the, you know, goals and or on two out of four, um, if you, you know, count women, people of color, veterans, residency. And, you know, as long as, you know, if they have very few employee employees, period, and they're having, you know, they've got someone who's an Amherst resident or a Hampshire resident, but they don't have somebody who's a woman, you know, you can say, oh, well, they, they did make an effort in that regard. Um, if they have a lot of employees and clearly, you know, haven't made an effort on multiple of them or have only focused on one, you know, that's just all of what gets taken into account when it's evaluating, is this somebody who made an effort for future work? But there's no, there is no, under this bylaw, um, there's no penalty for it. There's no um, hard and fast evaluation process even that the town does. The town just has an ability, again, those, the staff who are dealing with it know where a contractor has you know, made some attempts or just said, I don't care. I'm just bringing who I'm bringing and I'm not gonna care about any of this. And it provides that town staff with a tool to say, that's a contractor we don't really want to use again because they just disregarded it totally. I don't think we come into issues of, well, they only really cared about this or there was, or the contractor wasn't clear on kind of which ones to prioritize. We just haven't run across that kind of situation. Um, they are generally trying on all of them and, you know, they either made efforts towards it or they disregarded it and didn't, didn't focus on it. So looking at H, if you change to uh, just a little bit, so uh, the contractor shall make a good faith effort to provide, as opposed to endeavor, is that, is that more clear? Well, I'm going to stick with KP law on endeavor. Yeah, I, it, to me they're the same, I, they mean the same. And it's simpler. Yeah. I guess you know, what we're relying on here is that when a contractor uh, reads this um, and GNH, they would get guidance from town staff as to what uh, they should be doing. Because um, I can see Andy's point that you know you're just reading it from a straightforward point of view, you think, well, you know, which am I supposed to give preference to here? Um, and if I have, you know prospective employees who uh, come from the Amherst area or from the areas that are identified in G, but they're all white, um, how do I balance that against the desire to, and if I ignore, if I, you know, go outside of the area um, to get people of color, um, is that violating G? I guess the answer you're giving us is that there, there's no penalty here, so there's no technical violation. These are aspirational. The, the challenges exist even in just H alone. Yeah. You know, you know, is women more important versus veterans versus people of color? Um, and the practicality is, is that the, there have not been as UMass's campus and you know, East Hampton and Springfield, there, there have not been, you know, where contractors are making efforts, it shows up in different degrees on that. Okay. Um, and where contractors are doing a great job, it shows up that they're achieving all of it. And, and then there are contractors who, you know, continue to just bring white men um, from outside an area. Okay. I, let me just speak to this as somebody who's had to, who's, who's written multiple proposals over the years where I've had to meet these kinds of requirements or at least address them and you know in a cost proposal for example or even in the technical proposal this might take up two three pages it could talk everything about how you recruited it could talk about and then have some kind of matrix that shows 
percentages in each of these and qualifications and stuff like that, it's in some ways it leaves it to the creativity of the contractor to be convincing. And in some cases you might get a, a federal or state agency or even a, a, a um, foundation, although they, they don't usually come in with these kinds of requirements. Um, they might give you some kind of format that they want you to answer to. The federal government is the most strict on this and um, you know, you just have to show, you have to show effort and if you're smart, you show success. So it's a matter of, it, it's a matter of creativity. I hate to say it. It's creativity and how you convince them and it's creativity, frankly, and even how you go about recruiting because Sometimes the recruiting to meet these categories can be brutal. Okay, well, let's go on. Okay, I'm not hearing a, uh, a consensus to change this, um, though I think Andy's raised an, a good point that, um, but the counter seems to be that this is really in some ways more a tool for town staff in evaluating uh, future contracting um, and that the language is clear enough in terms of, of what we're asking and there is no penalty. So we have a motion on the table. It's been seconded. I'm ready to proceed to vote unless there are further comments. Hearing and seeing none, I'm going to move to vote. Um, Lynn. Yes. Uh, Mandy? Abstain. Uh, Pat? Yes. Uh, George, the chair votes yes. Uh, Andy? Yes. So the vote is uh, four in favor, none against, and one abstention um, on this motion. Um, the second motion is to uh, declare the wage and tip theft bylaw to be clear, consistent, and actionable. Is there a second? Yes. Uh, Lynn has seconded. Any comments or discussion further on this um, bylaw on this motion? Seeing none, I'm prepared to move to a vote. Um, this time I'll begin with Pat. Yes. Uh, Lynn? Yes. Mandy? Abstain. Uh, I vote yes. Andy? Yes. Again, the vote is four in favor, none against, and one abstention. Um, both motions um, pass. All right. Um, we're almost on schedule. Um, I want to move now to uh, the uh, bylaw that has uh, been presented. It's been through CRC and approved by CRC. I believe the vote was unanimous. Um, but I will check with that later. This is prohibiting the use of wild and exotic animals to traveling shows and circuses. And you should find in your packet three documents related to this bylaw. Um, one was the initial KP law uh, response, which was basically one sentence saying, we have no uh, you know, changes to recommend to this bylaw. Um, the second is the bylaw itself. Um, the third is a, uh, a series of uh, email messages back and forth because a member of this committee, um, I thought very astutely, uh, actually looked into Mass General Law and found uh, what he felt might be a possible uh, conflict. And so I put that into an email, sent it to KP Law, and lo and behold, very quickly actually, they sent back uh, the document that you have in your uh, packet. And if anyone actually read the three uh, uh, legal, uh, what are they? Um, anyway, it seemed like KP Law was getting their revenge. <laughs> um, and so they hit us with everything but the kitchen sink. But the bottom line is they did not see a problem with um, existing state law on this um, related to circuses and um, this, this proposed bylaw. So those are the three documents in your packet. Um, 
if we could put the uh, the bylaw up on the screen. I'm just uh, going to take my leave of the committee. Oh, oh, okay, Mandy Jo, you Lisa, have yes, you, thank you. Uh, for, yes. Um, again, we're simply uh, here to uh, determine whether this is clear, consistent, and actionable. Um, as I've just said, the one question of actionability in terms of potential conflict with state law was addressed in the uh, second KP law memo, where they deemed this not to be um, in conflict. And um, otherwise they had no changes to make. CRC, Mandy, was this a unanimous vote? Did, did you um, I least. just looked it up. It was four zero with one absent. The absent member was Sarah Swartz. Okay. All right. Um, any comments, questions, concerns about this bylaw in terms of clarity, consistency, and actionability, or any comments or concerns about the KP law uh, communications? Um. Can I speak, George? Matt, please. I support this um, bylaw, and I think it's clear, consistent, and actionable. And for me, it is, uh, I'm delighted that it is here and alive and well because it was presented, the idea of it was presented to us by Rebecca Schwartz. Uh, Schwar I'm not, not sure if her last name. name. Um, but uh, to Lynn and I at our very, very first district meeting. So I'm glad that it's come to fruition and we're getting ready to look at it and vote on it. And Shalini is the sponsor. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So there's no conflict. So I, uh, you, George. <laughs> I heard you. <laughs> so I guess when we get down to the, for the purposes of this committee, I do think that it is clear, consistent, and actionable. Uh, I've read through the bylaw several times and have, I, and have identified no further issues and can find in no place uh, now after uh, hearing from KP law that it's in conflict uh, with the state law. KP law has advised us that the answer to that is no. And uh, so um, and as far as support for the bylaw, I think that that's a different issue. I will speak to that at the um, council meeting. I have said to, the, uh, to Shalini uh, very clearly that I am uncomfortable with loading our bylaws, um, our town bylaws with unnecessary bylaws and that if a bylaw is speaking to an issue that uh, is something that has never come up and we have no real indication is likely to occur is being done just because it's a statement of uh, gee we really uh, think that, that the, this is a bad activity uh, that doesn't seem to me to be a reason to load our bylaws but that's an issue for the council. I don't think that's an issue for clarity, consistency, or actionability. I'm going to yeah. go off track just a tad. Um, I know that in other municipalities, when uh, bylaws present or an ordinance is presented, the sponsors' names are listed. Um, and you guys knew that it was me and Mandy Joe and Kathy, but would that be helpful to both the committee and the council to have that information directly um, when we're presenting? Well, I, it, yeah, it, it should be in the GOL report and it should be made clear before the council. It doesn't actually go into this document. Yeah, no, I know it doesn't go into right. the document. I actually right. try to make a point of listing the sponsors when I introduce an item on the agenda. Right. Right. So on the agenda plus I do my goof, but I try to. No. And and the same with GOL. It should be made clear in a GOL report who the sponsors are. Sometimes I, I don't 
always do that. So, Pat, your point is well taken that this be clearly communicated to the council and to the public. Um, and there's both the agenda and also the GOL report um, and our discussion, which of course is a public discussion where it should be made clear. Um, so I need to do a better job on that as well. Any, uh, I don't, I'm not seeing or hearing any concerns about clarity, consistency, and actionability. I was just going to say one thing. Andy, you guys please. have seen me adding in periods and stuff, semicolons mm. there instead of commas and a period here. Okay. Just correcting some of the Scrivener stuff. I, I will say when it was presented to us at CRC, it was not in this format. Ah, um, it was okay. not in a format consistent with our bylaws. So I was, I, I put it in that format for CRC to be able to see it. Um, the sponsors were, saw the new format and this is the format that CRC voted. Um, but I didn't obviously proofread everything as I went through to, for everything. And I'm seeing more as I scroll, but, um, well, then maybe but, we should uh, go through it briefly just because that is, uh, and Mandy, you've been very, very good about this and we're much in your debt, but mm -hmm. that is, um, and for Athena's sake, that is really one of our functions is to make sure that this is in the proper form. And, yeah. you know, so do you want to uh, go through it? I think probably we should. I mean, we should at least look at it. I tried to put it in the proper form so that the sponsors would be able to see it and mainly so that CRC would see it in the proper form so that when it got here and got everything moved around, if it did, CRC wasn't, wouldn't be like, wait, that's not what it looked like when we voted on it. So, but... I didn't necessarily proofread for all the small sort of consistency stuff. Okay, well then maybe we should take the time for a few moments and do that now, um, if that's all right with the rest of the committee. Otherwise we could come back to it next time after people have had a chance, but I think we have the time today to do that. Um, if we have the time today, I'm sorry? that would be good because I right now I'm hoping it will go on the agenda for the 19th. Okay. Uh, Andy has read it a number of times. He's not noted anything, but this is a different kind of reading. Um, there's also a question of what the actual correct format is for bylaws. And I know that I don't have a particularly firm grasp of that. I think Mandy does have a better grasp, perhaps. I, I basically tried to copy one that was already in, in force right. that had a penalty <laughs> block and penalties and copy the same structure, including the A, B, 1, 2, whatever you'd do. Right, right. So. Right. Oh, that rhymes. <laughs> well, that's an added bonus. Um, okay, let's go through um, the, the header. We're okay. Penalties for violation of the, uh, excuse me, so uh, prohibiting the use of wild and exotic animals in traveling shows and circuses. Penalties for violation of the prohibiting, excuse me, penalties for violation of the prohibiting the use of? Yep, the, it's the same title. <laughs> okay. And then it adds bylaw at the end. Okay. Criminal enforcement violation. No punctuation. Fine. Non-criminal dis disposition. Enforcement by police department, animal welfare officer. Fine. A purpose. It is the intent of the Amherst Town Council to protect the public against hazards that wild and exotic animals used in traveling shows and circuses posed to society and to protect wild and exotic animals from cruel and inhumane treatment. I, I do want to say uh, that the bylaw review committee felt like purpose, it could be there, but is not a requirement in writing up a bylaw, that generally the purpose is in, embedded in the title of the bylaw, but it can go either way. And I think the last two we just voted on today had purpose statements, or at least one of them did. Um, so we have gone either way. Right. I really like purpose statements. I do too. Um, I think it's a good way to begin, um, even if it's in the title and is somewhat repetitive. I kind of like it. Definitions B, for the purpose of this bylaw only, comma, the following words and terms shall be deemed to mean and to be construed as follows. And here, I'm not going to read this, but I'll let people read it silently if they see any problems with punctuation, parentheses, et cetera. So I'm going to be silent for a moment as you read through one, two, three, and four. 
can I ask a question Please. in definitions that are in the previous one we passed and then what's coming in surveillance tech, we have capitalized each individual word in the definitions and then continued to capitalize throughout the bylaw. Um, I can start making those changes for traveling show and wild or exotic animal uh, if that's our plan to make sure that they're always capitalized. Yeah, I'd go ahead and do it. Please. It would do something like this. Yeah. Thank you. So person, circus, traveling, show, and wild, and exotic. I must say that as uh, a reviewer looking at some of the terms used in uh, number four, in this, all of the, uh, it's using terminology that obviously I'm not as familiar with because of uh, not my area of professional expertise. <laughs> You're not a trained botanist or, bi excuse me, biologist or, uh, right? I yeah, can say I, that Evan's place on CRC paid well here because he was able to look at that and say, oh, wait, some of that includes this, and do we really want to include that? <laughs> so. <laughs> I miss him on GOL. He specifically did it with artiodactyla <laughs> that I can't even pronounce. <laughs> that right. has llamas and alpacas. <laughs> yes, right. Okay. I want us good. <clears throat> we want to move quickly, but <clears throat> we do want to be thorough. Sorry, if I'm moving too quick, let yeah. me. So if we went, went through, uh, if we can roll back up just for a moment. Um, do I so, need to roll up further? Yeah, please, if you don't mind. Okay. So one, two, three, and four. No, we have the change in the capitalization. Any other problems people notice? No. Okay, then this under four. Just as we go through. right there. Thank you. Did the next animals in number <coughs> capitalized? I, mean, I don't think this one does because no, it's not okay. referring to wild or exotic. All right, fine. And then here's four. I'm trying to get every all of four in. And Let me know when I can scroll to five. I'm ready. Yep, please. Animals after exotic. Okay. Good. Okay. Yep. I switched ordinance to bylaw. Yeah. I just happened to miss that one. Thank you. I think this is the provisions of this bylaw shall not apply to. And the exceptions. Yes. 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 Yeah. Capital B. Are we capitalizing bylaw? That's a question. Yeah, I don't know. I think we've done that in the past, so I have to go up and do that one other place, I think. And I. How about down below where you changed it to bylaw? Yep, I got that one, I think. The purposes okay. of this bylaw. Um, yeah, I got it here. Yep, got it. Yeah. All right. Okay. And that's the end. That's the end. Okay, good. So unless there are any further comments, observations, I'm prepared to entertain a motion to declare uh, this bylaw. If we can scroll up to the title. <laughs> <laughs>
You don't have it memorized, George? No, I haven't. I'm sorry. Uh, prohibiting the use of wild and exotic animals in traveling shows and circuses to be clear, consistent, and actionable. Is there a second? Second. Angelus. And has seconded. Any further comment or discussion? One more. We define person. Ouch. Okay. So that's the only place it shows up. Consider that a friendly change. <laughs> yes. It was being made while he was making the motion. So it's right. included in the motion. Speaking. Still speaking. <laughs> I think we have to revote. <laughs> no, no. Be quiet. I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. All right. So we have a motion that's been seconded. I prepared oh. I'm sorry. Sorry. The purpose has wild and exotic animals. Oh my goodness. Yep. Yeah. And traveling shows. And circuses. Yeah. Right. These are scrivener errors. And then exotic animals. Yeah. That's correct. Thank yep. you. Okay, I think that's it. Move the question. Go. <laughs> All right. Prepared to move to a vote. Um, Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Lynn Griesemer. Yes. Manny Johanneke. Yes. The chair is a yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. So the vote is unanimous 5-0, declaring this bylaw clear, consistent, and actionable. We have a resolution uh, before us. There are two documents in the packet. This is a re resolution on East-West Rail. And the oh, sponsor, you, I'm sorry? Nothing, sorry. Uh, okay. Working on it. And the sponsor is, uh, the, is Lynn Griesemer. Right. And um, I think there were eventually three versions that I saw, but I believe what's in your packet that's relevant is um, draft two. Did I put the wrong one up, Lynn? Well, it's that Lynn will tell us. Um, this and then there's also your changes, which I believe I accepted all of them. Right. Okay. So are we looking at your document, Mandy Joe? Yes, okay. that's the one I had in the packet. If that's not the right one, I'll find the right one. Well, Lynn, you sent me two drafts, but I'm hoping that the draft that Mandy Joe went through and made changes on was based on draft two. That's the correct draft. Okay, so we can look at this document. Should I accept all the changes in this one? I would. Okay. Yes. Okay. We're going to go through this line by line, if you can bear with me. Resolution supporting east-west passenger rail. Whereas, the res whereas residents of Amherst are un underserved by public transit connecting them to Worcester and Boston. And whereas the flagship campus of the University of Massachusetts located in Amherst and many of its students, faculty and staff would benefit from public transit connecting them to Eastern Massachusetts including other UMass campuses and work and internship opportunities in Worcester and Boston. Is there a comma needed there? No. No. It's, right. Whereas train service would provide an alternative to travel on the heavily congested Massachusetts Turnpike. And whereas travel by rail reduces carbon emissions and air pollutants. And whereas inequity in public transportation creates an environmental justice issue for low income and minority populations living in Amherst. And whereas Amherst is a potential passenger rail stop on the Central Corridor rail line running between New London, Connecticut and Brattleboro, Vermont. And no, whereas a passenger uh, car, really Lynn? What, Lynn? I'm sorry, go ahead, but that's not really true because they moved it from Amherst to Northampton. Right. Yeah, I was wondering about that too. It says potential. You have to be a bi. <laughs> go ahead. Just, I mean, yeah. they, they, they talk about um, pending restoration of train service to the Amherst station there. It'd be great, but go ahead. It's not going to yeah. happen, but. Yeah, right. So is that a matter of clarity, consistency, or action? <laughs> or just, just reality? 
<laughs> this committee does not deal with reality. <laughs> <laughs> It's, yeah, it's always a potential, stuff. George. It's still there. It could be a potential rail stop. Right, exactly. Right. Could be a potential space station, too, but uh, anyway. All right. So, um, whereas a passenger rail stop in Palmer could serve as a transfer point to train service north on the Central Corridor rail line to Amherst, and whereas PDTA bus service connecting Amherst to Belchertown Center could be extended to Palmer as an interim step, Ending restoration of train service to Amherst Station, period. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the town of Amherst supports east-west passenger rail connecting Springfield and Boston with a station stop in Palmer, period. Be it further resolved that the clerk of the Amherst Town Council shall cause a copy of this resolution to be sent to Massachusetts Governor Charles Baker, members of Mass DOT East-West Study Advisory Committee, Massachusetts President of the Senate, Karen E. Spilka, Massachusetts Speaker of the House Representative, Robert A. DeLeo, State Senator Joanne Ann Cumberford, and State Representative Mindy Dom, period. I don't see any typos or punctuation or any sorts of uh, issues like that. Any concern about clarity, consistency, or actionability in the text? I, I just capitalized resolution with our capitalized thing right here. Okay. Okay. I could see this has nothing to do with our decision, whether it's actionable, but I could see people wanting to mess with this issue of the Amherst rail stop ETA buses, but that's not our concern. Right, exactly. That they may want to come in or change that, but and and I personally would like to add, and I should have done this earlier, um, Transportation Chair, uh, Senate Transportation Chair. Um, yeah. Um, I'm blanking on his name. What East Longmeadow. Oh, yeah. Um, I can see his face. Yes. Lesser. Yes. yes. Lesser. Thank What's you. What's Lesser's first name, though? Eric. <laughs> Eric. Eric. <thank> <laughs> Good thing this is a is it L E S S E R? Yes, That's my recollection okay. is Eric Lesser. And is it called Transportation Committee or is it something else? I'll check it out right now. Okay, so we want to add that recipient, and Lynn's going to check for a moment to see if there's a the title of the title change, committee. so we can make these changes if we have to. Yep. with Athena's help, but it'd be nice and, to get it over. And we tend to for for Lynn's purposes when we have the sponsors at here like we did with um, um, the other two bylaws we just did today if the sponsor wants to add stuff we let it be added in this committee we just don't talk about whether it's good or bad right I think George I think that's sort of accurate we've allowed the sponsors to make changes while it's in front of the committee absolutely you know yeah. Absolutely. Take the lesser out because actually it's unless we want to put in Bonacor because he's actually chair and Strauss. So don't, why don't you just say members of the Joint Committee on Transportation? Member, have it. I think that's actually good because <laughs> of all of them. They change. I'm going to move where it goes. To after. I think after Mindy Dom. You want it after Mindy? Yeah. Well, you have, you have, um, uh, it should at least be after the Speaker of the House. Yeah, why don't you put it in there? Okay. Yeah, uh, it yeah, doesn't matter. And, um, is it the, is it just the Joint Committee or do we call it, you know, the, because it's the Senate and the House. The the, joint. When you say joint, that takes care okay. of it. We'll know that it's the state house. Uh, should say of the of the of joint. the general court. Yeah, after transportation of the general. That's what I was getting at. Yeah. That's that's good. Okay. So, um, and Mandy is absolutely correct. 
that when we're dealing with resolutions, uh, we like to have the sponsors present um, and any changes made are made mutually um, because the goal is to, to get it to the council in the form that the sponsors want it, but also in a form that's clear, consistent, and actionable. So whenever possible, we ask sponsors to be present. There are, there are occasions though when we um, do it on our own. So you want to accept all the changes before we send it, Mandy Jo? I, I will do that as I finalize it. Okay. Um, before I copy George and Athena and you on all four that we're voting today. Great. All right, we have in front of us now the resolution as revised, amended. Um, any further comments? If not, I'm prepared to entertain a motion. Uh, seeing no hands, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, Go ahead. I'll move to declare the resolution supporting the east-west passenger rail clear, consistent, and actionable. I'll second it, Deanne. We have a second in Pat, okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'm going to move to vote. I'm going to begin with uh, Pat. Yes. Uh, I'm going to go to Lynn. Seeing no conflict as a sponsor, I vote yes. I'm never going to be able to live this down. No. Okay. <laughs> um, Mandy. Was that Mandy or Andy? Uh, it was Mandy. Okay, then yes. <laughs> I'm still on speaking terms with Mandy, I think. Um, the chair votes yes. Andy? Yes. All right, the vote is 5-0, unanimous, um, to uh, accept this uh, resolution as clear, to declare this resolution as clear, consistent, and actionable. All right, so it's only 12 noon, and we have gotten through, um, we do not have minutes, um, and that's no criticism of either the minutes speaker or of uh, Athena. We only had one week turnaround. And so we will deal with the minutes um, at the next meeting of GOL. According to my calendar is October 21st. Um, we have no public present. Um, so I'm going to uh, note that there's no public comment because there's no public present. Um, what we have, we have about half an hour and um, we have on the agenda discussion of the process for creating uh, the town manager performance and assessment goals, um, which is my crude attempt to sort of bring us back to something we worked on very, very hard um, and um, do some, somewhat of a postmortem and also a, a thinking of what we could recommend to the council what we might want to recommend to the council going forward um, to make the process a little bit more consistent, a little bit smoother, a little bit less um, onerous. Um, so that is something that I'd like us to, um, if we have the energy at this point, uh, to wrap our minds around or to suggest how we might begin doing that um, over the next uh, few weeks or months. Um, so can I ask a point of clarification? Is this to talk about how we went about setting goals or is it also to talk about, and or is it also to talk about um, how we evaluate the manager? I think it's both in my mind because both seem to have fallen to this committee. Um, and so the question, I think Lynn is correct, it's really both. It's the process of evaluating and it's this of goals. Should it be with this committee? If not, where should it be? Um, and insofar as it is with this committee, um, what should be the process? Um, mm -hmm. For better or for worse, the council gave it to this committee. I was personally quite thankful they did. Yeah. I think you have provided Good advice. Um, let me just speak to the goal setting since I was involved in the goal setting right. years in a row now. Andy was in probably involved in the year before that. Uh, this was the smoothest goal setting I've seen, although the rest of you may feel it wasn't. Uh, the fact that we had to go back, I think, four times for discussion with the council 
didn't surprise me. On the other hand, we got it done in September versus January, which tells you right there, it was a whole lot smoother. Um, and I think that um, it's a test because they're much more um, overall broad statements with examples. But what I really, really liked was the fact that policy goals were each pinned to previous actions of the council. And the fact that each gave then examples or things that are in our bailiwick, if you will, to follow up. So in many ways, I think upon the goals that we set for the town council, I mean, for the town manager as a statement of the council's goals when it comes particularly to policy. So in general, I just feel very, very um, grateful for the process that went into setting the goals this year. Are people, uh, again, please raise your hand or just speak up. I, I, this is gonna be free form. Um, I can see you all, you're all unmuted, so you shouldn't hesitate to, to just jump in. Um, what do people think, first of all, about just the, the format in which these goals were presented? In other words, distinguishing between policy and management, trying to keep them relatively balanced in terms of number, um, it seems like we have a, a kind of rubric or format that at least Lynn and I think I find fairly clear and coherent and a structure that could be used going forward for the next time tied to specific town council actions. Because again, we often get into this, you know, somebody's convinced that this is a town council goal, which is not, it's, it's something they want. Um, and so it's important. And I think we did succeed this time in identifying goals that all of us share. Right. So first of all, just the, the, the way it was the, the actual document, the form it was in, is that something people feel, would they like to change it? Are they unhappy with it? Would they be willing to go to the council and say, this is the kind of format we'd like to continue to use? Aside, aside from the process for the moment, just the, the form of the document, I, Any thoughts about that? In general, I like the format. What I'm still unsure of is as we were converting from the old format to this one, we had to decide what things got numbered and what didn't get numbered um, and whether there were numbers. You know, there's sort of the initial statement of, you know, implement climate action policy or whatever. Um, but then it was like by doing or, you know, these sort of things. Um, and I think that's where I'm still unsure whether we need that or not. And if we do need it, how specific that gets or how many should be in each of those. Um, you know, I know the management goals got fairly long when we started listing stuff like that, whereas the the policy goals were a little more um, a little more generic even in those lists yet I you know so I'm I, I think that's where we could get tripped up in further years but at the same time I think it helps will help we'll have to see next year will help with the evaluation process when we get to that of oh did he talk about these things or did he not um, but since there are specifics there that's where we could really get down to should this one be listed or should that one be listed and so I'm still not convinced that going into that specificity is good or bad. I don't know yet. Okay. Sort of the same reaction that Mandy just expressed. Um, my experience from my years on the select board that is that the hard part is to make it both a uh, concise enough document that it's uh, actually can be reasonably accomplished, which I think we have, we did, and that there be a clear um, and easily usable linkage to the evaluation process um, that comes forward. And that's where we need to see how it plays out. I 
the questions that it raises for me um, are that I want to think about the goals, and that is, is there a point where we as a council should regularly come back and look at the goals? You know, for instance, six months after adoption, but before we begin the evaluation process. So part of me wants to develop almost a calendar of, you know, here's when we do goals, here's when we review goals. And, and I, I have to say, I'm, you know, starting to think about the fact that, um, you know, the next time we set goals, we will be passing them on to the next uh, council. And, you know, should there be a way in which we say, you know, I, we think in February or March at the latest, um, any council should review the goals and make any adjustments so that it's then set up for the evaluation. The other thought in this, because every time I, we were working on the goals, I kept saying, okay, what will the evaluation document look like? And I think we should start playing with that so that we have a, a clear feeling about how it might work and um, so forth. So those are, and that also fits in to the calendar sense when, which very much is starting the evaluation earlier. And then again, I also wanna be, make people aware of the fact that the evaluation is tied to the renewal, not right away, but in another two years to the renewal of the contract or the fact that any evaluation, if there's an attempt to not renew a contract or to break a contract has to be done far enough in advance unless it's for cause. Um, so there's, there's other pieces in this that need to be looked at the turnover from this council to the next council, the um, fact that the town manager's contract is tied to the evaluation, the fact that the charter requires the evaluation, and when do we actually do the evaluation and whether or not that will help us capture um, greater responses. Although I have my own personal opinion about whether or not you can ever capture greater responses. I'm more than glad to share with people. But, um. so in talking about timing, I wonder if we can try to do the goals earlier. Um, even with our fairly streamlined process this year, we still didn't pass them till September, early September, but September, which is two months into the year. Yeah, no, um, and, right. and so do they specifically need tied to the previous evaluation, I think is a question we should ask. Um, mm -hmm. Or are, you know, can we be passing them in mid-July right after budget, which would put a committee working on revising goals potentially before we've even seen the manager's self-evaluation and everything. Um, you know, I, I think we have to talk about that timeline too, because, you know, if we're going to be re-looking at them six months later, well, that's March, you know, right. pretty much. And there, you know, if he gets reviewed and submits a self-evaluation in July, you can't really change stuff. Three months is a very small amount of time to sort of correct um, given what the goals are. Um, so I think we need to look at the timing of passage of the goals, or at least the start of the development of the goals to see if we can get the passage closer into potentially July or early August. Well, and, and people have suggested they would like to see the evaluation occur earlier, <laughs> which I agree with, but I also don't want to, I mean, if we had started to try to throw evaluation activity into June and July when we were trying to sort through the budget mess this year. I think we all would have, you know, run from the room screaming. But we might be able to 
to put some of the evaluation stuff earlier. I was yeah. talking about I timeline, think. like going out to yeah. committee chairs in public can probably be in May and early June. Yeah. And, you know, and if Paul submits his self-evaluation in early July, we might be able to do it in late July instead of late August. So having a calendar and having that calendar reside with a specific committee and committee chair um, or having it reside with the president, um, uh, these seem sensible to me. I like the idea of it being with a specific committee because then it's part of that committee's um, job is to keep track of this sort of thing and make sure that, you know, keep an eye on the calendar, et cetera. It could become something that the president does, which is, you know, add to her list of things to do. Um, we have become the de facto or whatever committee for doing this. That may be objected to by other members of the council. We'll have to deal with that. But doesn't it make sense that they have a group of people, not just one person, but a group of people, um, part of whom the responsibility is keeping an eye on that, creating that calendar and keeping an eye on it, and then making sure that specific actions get taken when they should be taken? Or should that stay with the president? No, I think it needs to stay with the committee. I think the committee, I, I would also say maybe enlist the clerk's help too in keeping that calendar and calendaring to remind committee chairs, because as committees turn over, hopefully our clerk doesn't turn over too frequently. And mm -hmm. so she might be able to do calendar and pings for her to send out reminders to committee chairs. Oh, it's now time for you to start thinking about this or, you know, things like that. We're trying to do it with resolutions that happen yearly, but but I would include the clerk in the right. calendar. Right. And and I, as much as I agree with trying to, you know, do a review of the goals um, on an every six month basis and backing it up to as early as January, every other year, that means it is part of the quote orientation of a new body which is good. It should be part of the orientation of a new body. Right. Not they then feel prepared to chime in on changes to the goals is a whole nother issue. Um, and then the other piece is does, I, th I, I really don't believe that you want the outgoing body to do a review and December, unless for something, unless something really serious like COVID has emerged. Um, it's really something that should come up with the seating of a new body. I really like the idea of reviewing the policies um, and goals periodically because that was one of the things that when we were deliberating about the, and finalizing the policies, we kind of promised the community that we were creating a living document and that we would be as a group um, making sure that if changes were necessary, they came forward and were, were there in this document. So I, I'm not sure what that process should look like, uh, but I think it's a critical one, particularly around uh, issues of racial equity um, and probably energy and climate action as well, but definitely around racial equity issues um, because those, those are in many ways the most difficult issues to address on so many levels. Um, and I think that we need to consistently review for that. The very fact that we hired ambassadors and I remember Paul saying, oh, I didn't think of that when somebody said, are they all white? Did you hire any people of color? And he, he honestly, and I respect him for that, just said, oh, I didn't think of that. So to me, how do we um, make sure that kind of thinking is present in the decisions he makes and the decisions that we make? Um, so I don't know, that's kind of where I want to also bring up the issue of the role of the public in the formation of these goals. Um, if this resides in a committee and we are having, you know, obviously public meetings where we're 
trying to shape, as we did shape this document, um, then there's a clear place where people can go if they wish to express their thoughts on this. Um, how important is that in this process? I mean, clearly we're focused on just the challenge of 13 people coming to some agreement as to what the goal should be and how they should be expressed. And that's a really difficult job. But there also seems to be a place for the public's involvement, I assume, and, and their input. And that is a transparent process. It's not something that's done, you know, um, you know, in the dark. It, it's, it's so they can come and, and witness or listen or contribute, or speak in public comment. I assume that, that it makes our job more difficult, but that's okay. I mean, that's right. Um, so I'm, how important is that? I, I'm of a strong opinion that I, that before we, I mean, public can always come that they can come sit in when it, <coughs> when we're formulating the goals, whatever. But the reality is, before we get into too much depth of public opinion, we need other counselors' opinions. Right. And, and so it seems to me that while it may have seemed arduous to the rest of you uh, because of the amount of public opinion that we ended up with this year. The reality is it made those goals better. Mm -hmm. And it was done as a council and some counselors who were not on the committee that originally kind of at, that developed the goals um, had for some very strong opinions. And so I, I think there has to be in the timeline, there has to be a date by which we start feeling the counselors out or introducing it to the counselors. And I think there has to be a date and, and there should be public comment at least at one time specifically related to the goals during a council meeting. After that, it can be during general public comment. But there, that's just my feelings about it. Andy? Uh, well, we're covering two different topics, really, because we've covered calendar and we've covered public input. On the calendar thing, the one thing that we didn't talk about was when the uh, town manager's contract renews and whether the, that becomes a factor. So there's the renewal of the contract, there's the fiscal year are the two things. I think the renewal of the contract made third actually more important. Uh, uh, just for historical purposes, because it uh, kind of can lay some of the calendar piece to rest. Um, the select board was driven in its uh, summer schedule by wanting to do it after the end of town meeting. We don't have an annual town meeting anymore, so uh, that should be put to rest. Uh, as far as public input, yes, we need you know, I think the public has plenty of time for input and it was a stronger document because we heard from the public and we at least, oh, we didn't agree with everything they said. We certainly thought about it and um, did, did things consciously with what we heard in mind. And that's an important part of everything the council does. Town manager's contract comes up for renewal in 20, 2024. I'm checking that right now. Into what month? Uh, August, end of August. Yeah, that's what I had thought. Yeah, about. And, and then, but there is also the issue of. Is it a six month it, notice? It's six. Uh, I'm looking at that right now, Mandy Joe. Yeah, I'm sorry. It comes up. At the end of August in 2023, we purposely timed it so it would be in the uh, after a, it would not be in. It's in a non, it's in an election year, which means right. the it's council will be at the end year. of its term. Right. It's, but it gives councillors more of a basis. Uh, and so we essentially made it almost a four year contract. The issue of notification if you want to terminate i'm looking at if you want me i can put the contract up 
now. Uh, do you want me to do that? No, I don't think so. No. Okay. We only have five minutes left. Yeah, but let me make sure that the contract is in the document, is in our file the next time we have this conversation. Trying to get counselor input on the goals process, something we'll talk about, I'm sure again. Um, in my dream world, we have a retreat. And we sit down and we, we talk about, I mean, you talk about the next year, you talk as a group, the 13 of you. Maybe that's, that's just not possible, forget it, fine, okay. Then still the question becomes, how do we get 13 people to, um, that are out and all in the same place at the same time with their minds focused on that one specific topic. How do we get them to um, give us their, and we, you know, it's not that complicated, but essentially we solicit their, their, uh, you know, what do you want for goals for the coming year? That That's not that complicated, I guess. I really like the idea of us being together and talking about, right. But put that aside for a moment. We need to obviously get their opinions. Then it comes to this body and we start shaping a document, which is a goals document. Does that start in the ninth month? The 10th month? So this calendar question that we need to sort out, but we create two documents, a goals document and an evaluation document. Their timelines for both, they hopefully be fairly much in sync. Um, and it comes to this body to do those things. If, if it is useful to the body, um, since I have, you know, the vast majority of the files related to this, I can try to develop the initial, an initial idea of a calendar and put in all of these different pieces under categories of goals, um, evaluation and contract, and bring that back to whenever we're ready for our next discussion. And and just it, 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 I think we need, I think there's a way to synchronize this. I, but I do want to keep in mind that certain bodies of the council, main, namely the finance committee, uh, starting really in April, but in the, and, but mostly on May 1st, um, becomes very busy with the budget. Yeah. They're busy mostly, correct me if I'm wrong, Andy, finance is mostly a May and maybe early June because the, re right. the report and recommendation has to be done within 30 days of referral, right? The only thing that's different from that, Mandy Joe, is we do the regional school budget before that. Right. So, so June is a lot less busy than May and April, I guess is where yeah. I was thinking. So starting yeah. in June, in a normal a, year, yes. In a normal year, yes. <laughs> uh, well, I think we can. I think we can start doing evaluation collection in April, May, and April and May. Uh, but it does seem to me that um, we may not end up. If we adopted goals by the end of June, I think that'd be terrific. What we yeah. need. To do and the only thing. And I don't know what your experience now as counselors for this, because I'm looking at it from a longer perspective. The uh, feeling was is when problems were identified in an evaluation, it was important to be able to incorporate those into goals. And that's where that whole sequence came from. So you could do a preliminary adoption of goals even in June and then revisit them in, you know, July, August, whenever the evaluation. Yeah, no, I think the revisiting is actually the answer to the question. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to bring this, this has been helpful to me. I want to bring this to a conclusion, at least for today. I think it is something that this committee can do as a service to the council. There may be, probably will be, some who may object, does this fall under our charge? I think governance covers this, covers this, but just be prepared for that potential object. Who are you, GOL, to blah, blah, blah. But on the other hand, someone 
needs to step forward. Mm -hmm. And I think it should be more than one individual. So I very strongly believe that that's something that GOL should take on and that it's covered by our charge. That may not sale, but that's what I'm going to make the case for. But what I'm hearing today is that this body, this committee, should be able to produce a goals document, an evaluation document, a timeline or calendar, and a process for both evaluation and goal setting. Now, that's a tall order, but it seems to be crucial for this council going forward. After three years, we should be able to hand on to our successors um, these things. And I think we made excellent progress this year with the documents. And what I'm hearing is we have a lot of work to do in terms of just clarifying the process and establishing clear timelines in a calendar. Um, and then bringing that to the council, letting them know what we're doing, but also eventually bring it to the council for their, their approval. Right. Okay. I think they'll love us for this, but <laughs> I don't. They originally gave GOL the job, right? No, I, I think we're gonna we're gonna run with this until we get carried off in in manacles uh, right. to whatever. That's right. Um, Agree. Right. Uh, and you know, but I think it's really important. It's now we also have. It sounds like a couple of bylaws coming to us. We do. We have four bylaws that will be coming to us from DPW. And I have to go back in my notes. My guess is that some of them may have to go to TSO first. Okay. Don't yeah, so, so they are um, the stormwater bylaw, an illicit discharge bylaw, some water bylaw, and then we've had the flood maps that we've known about. Um, and I think Christine Breastrup talked about at least the flood map one. Uh, Lynn and I have no idea what they're going to look like. But, <laughs> that was my first question. They come to us in whatever form they come to us, and then we need to put them in the proper form. So let me, let me just say it's Andy Joe has to put them into the proper. Well, we, we, <laughs> we need to all of them because some the city. Joe may not be here. <laughs> Given that they're coming from town staff, they better put them in form. Right? Well, yeah, right. We understand. Water, but. illicit discharge, water bylaw, sewer bylaw, and the maps. So oh, there's, there's a sewer bylaw too, yeah. Okay, well, this I'm not cool. sure the maps are a bylaw. I just think... The, I think they are some sort... They're changes to the zoning bylaw. So I, I, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yes. right. Anyway, I got to go, actually. Right. So. Okay. Yeah. So well, does I'm Pat. Going, yeah, I will put this... Everybody. I'm going to put this on the agenda for next time. Continued discussion. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We, we hope we'll it George. Get some things from Lynn in terms of, of calendar, at least. I will do some thinking and maybe some writing in terms of document and so forth, just to probably put it in some better order. I will avoid thinking at all costs. <laughs> you get a break for a while. You've been thinking very hard. So. <laughs> so that's on our next agenda. I will do some work. Lynn will do some work. And then if we get some bylaws, we'll deal with them. Um, but Surveillance is going to come up. Huh? All right. Would you say? Surveillance. Face recognition technology, maybe by next meeting on GOL, if Pat and I have our fingers crossed. <laughs> um, yes. so the surveillance bylaw has been split in two, and we're hoping that the first half comes gets through um, TSO. TSO tomorrow. Yeah. But we'll see. We don't know. What is the other one? So it's face recognition. It was split into face recognition, prohibition bylaw, and surveillance technology oversight. And the surveillance technology oversight will be at least another month. Um, but face recognition is in front of TSO on Thursday. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. I'm going to declare this meeting adjourned at exactly 12:30. It seems. Wish you all a good day. Yeah. And uh, Mandy, you'll be Take sending care, us some everyone. stuff later. You've good. got it. Thank you all. Good meeting, guys. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, George. Well, thanks, Emily.